Thank you, Lord. We appreciate your being here this morning. Listen, we've had a couple church family services, some folks that have been with us a long time, and the and, uh, week before Phyllis Melton, uh, her family was here, and Miss Phyllis had been a part of our church for so long, went to be with the Lord. I want to thank the church family for all your help. Uh, we hosted both of those here at the church. And then for Ruby Ramsey's family, and uh, of course so much of her her family, her children and grandchildren are here with us. And, and, uh, and so the family has left a card, and it says this, our, our family of faith fellowship, thank you for, uh, it's such a small phrase, but it holds a very large expression of gratitude. It says, you indeed allow the words of Jesus to live in you doing, and not just with your words. Thank you for all you did to make the homegoing of our mom complete complete success. And again, we're forever for great, grateful, and that's Miss Ruby's family. And again, I want to thank our church family too. We, we appreciate your help at that time, and it's uh, such an important time that we, you know, even though these are difficult times, that we can still, you know, take care of the families uh, uh, of our church. And uh, thank you for being here, for serving, for, pro for providing a meal. Thank you ever so much. Well, on Sunday mornings, we're, we're talking about spending time with God. And uh, let me pray and we'll get started. We'll... Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word and to teach and to preach your gospel. How thankful we are, Father, that your word's good seed. When it's sown on good ground in our lives, we believing that it will produce good fruit. And we thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <laughs> Now, on Sunday mornings, is spending time with God in this, in this series, we have been talking about developing a private life, uh, something that I believe is of the greatest importance. You will find that so many people have ended up being a public embarrassment because they didn't manage their private life well. Now, if we don't spend time with God, you won't manage it well. As we've been talking about this, we have, we've mentioned success or the failure of our private lives will determine the success or failure of our public lives. We see this borne out in Scripture. So many times that character, whatever that character is, is revealed in a crisis. But character is developed in private. So we're going to continue along these lines of talking about our private life, spending time with God. Today we're going to emphasize the term to wait on. Lamentations 325, the Lord is good, isn't he? Say that with me, the Lord is good. He is, isn't he? The Lord is good to who? To those who wait for him. To the soul who seeks him. Well, we certainly live in a time where we need to see the goodness of God. Our nation's filled with chaos. I, you know, it didn't make any difference if uh, Miss Ruby went to be with the Lord. She was 93, and she would have said, I've never seen a day like this. I'm 63, and I've never seen a day like this. It just the chaos, the craziness. You watch the news, you have no idea what to believe. You turn on social media, you know you shouldn't believe. <laughs> With the exception of your post, you understand. <laughs> we just live in very unusual times. But you know what? Aren't you glad that God is sure? God is sure. And you know, in his... Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm enormously disappointed. I don't mind saying that where we're at, you know, in, in relationship to our nation and the elections. But you know what? I may be disappointed in that, but I'm not disappointed in the Lord. Again, crisis will reveal your character. Crisis will reveal your character. But the Lord's good for those, again, who wait on him.
Let me just mention these things. You might write them down once again because I would like for you to, you know, to the, you know, for these be things you you would begin to practice. Last week we talked specifically about how, how some things to do to develop your your uh, uh, your private life. Uh, many times we refer to some time that we spend alone with God as a quiet time, and uh, I really feel like talking about a quiet time does not resonate with men well, and uh, and so. You know, you always want to find a way to resonate with everybody, to see, you know, something that would speak to everyone. Well, let me just just change that phrase just a little bit, because and, and please don't think I don't think that it's important not to have a quiet time. I'm just saying, you know, uh, with a lot of men, that that term just doesn't resonate well. How about just how to wait on God? All right. How to wait on God. And so we've talked about these five elements. These are five things you can do. They're five things that every person can do. And if you'll practice these five things, that you'll find the amount of time that you'll spend with God and the pleasure that you'll find in spending that time with God will get, begin to be enhanced. Again, there's things that we don't want to do only because we don't know how to do it. You know, so many times, you know, I, I'll just use church as an example but if you, you know, you invite somebody in church, and, and, and this is typically what the ch church world does at times. Well, not always, but far too many times this has happened. Somebody gets saved. They're excited. They're excited about God. You know, they, they just seem like they're hungry for the things of God. So we'll get them, throw them in a classroom with six-year-olds and say, teach. And, of course, they don't know what to do, and they don't know how to do it. And as, as a result, they're, they would be reluctant to do it. How to wait on God? We've we, here, 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 are, here are some things that we, we can tell you some what to do and some how to do. You're going to wait on the Lord. See, we always go into his presence with thanksgiving. There's that time of worship, the time of worship. It is a time of fellowship. It's a time of sharing, exchanging. We've talked about, and boy, you talk about an important part of my life. This, this number three, when I say meditation, now I'm not talking about Zen, all right? And listen, I don't fool around with stuff like that. It's just, just your pastor talking. I don't fool around with that Zen. I don't believe in karma. Boy, I don't want to be, I want to be hearing about karma around here. We don't believe in karma here. We believe whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's what the word, God doesn't do karma. All right, we straighten that out. How about meditate? Meditate. Now, we're not talking about hum. We're not talking about getting, getting you know, uh, uh, we're not talking about pushing everything out of your mind. Right? You empty your mind. Let me tell you, the devil will fill it with something. I'm not emptying my mind. Meditate to think on, to ponder. To re you know, words mean something. Yeah. I, you know, when, you know, just because somebody, just because some mystic or somebody in Hollywood says, oh, I got, I'm, I'm, I'm connected with my inner being, you know. Now, you better be connected with that heavenly being. Meditate. It's a word. It means something. It means to think on, to ponder, to reflect. In the Hebrew, it means to say to oneself over and over again. You can think on, ponder, reflect the goodness of God. You can think on, ponder, and reflect his word. And that is primarily, I, sp I spend as much time doing that as anything else that I do. Think on, ponder, reflect. I say it to myself over and over. I've thought a lot about the last, you know, since, since Thursday on the term, wait on. Then when you're, you, you, again, waiting on the Lord, you, you, there's a time, of, it's a time of prayer. This is a time to have that conversation with God. This is a time to make your request to be made known. This, this is a time to pray for others. And then if you're going to spend time with God, you always have to listen. Lots of people would think God's not speaking today. There would be those that even would make fun of those of us that believe that God does speak today. Make fun and I'll listen. And I'll hear from heaven. Yeah. Isaiah 64.4. 4. 
This is my this is our text today. This 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 is going to help you. All right. I can almost just make this first statement. We could we could say it was bull with our time. Since time began, no one has ever imagined, no ear heard, no eye seen a God like you who works for those who waits. Look at that, man. I've underlined that. No eye has seen, no ear hath heard. A God like you. What's he do? He works, Ray, for those who wait. But we don't have time. You, don't, you must not need his help. You don't need the one who spoke the, the universes into existence. Who holds it all together? The Bible says that the worlds were framed by the word of God. I need his help, don't you? Amen. Yeah. My goodness, what a verse, huh? A God. How, how, how important is having a quiet time or waiting on God? How important? On a scale of 1 to 10, it's a 20. Amen. It's a 20. It's off the scale. It's off the scale. Yet it's not something we practice as a church. But what does God do? Oh, God works for those who wait. Well, I don't have time. And nor do you have his work. Huh. I don't have time. Well, and nor do you have his work. See, it's hard to imagine the work that's being accomplished as we wait on the Lord. Understand a faith without works is dead. I, I, I believe that verse. But listen, if I believe that verse, I need to believe this one too, though. The work that's being accomplished. See, again, when, if, I, if I go back to Gethsemane, Luke, the 24th chapter, and Jesus says to his disciples, would you come and pray with me? Would you pray just this one hour? Oh, your spirit's willing, he says, but your, your weakness is in your flesh, your flesh is weak. And so they, instead of spending time with God, they, they fell asleep. Now we, we, we all have slumber comes our way and we're fatigued. But gender, they, they didn't catch the magnitude of the hour that they lived in, nor did they catch the magnitude of the opportunity that they were presented with. See, they, they, they couldn't see what God could be doing while they were waiting on him. While they were waiting on him. Isaiah 40, 31. But those that wait on the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. See, there's a work going on while you're waiting. Renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall ascend. They shall rise up. They shall run, not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Now, that promise isn't to everybody. I often like to say there is an exclusivity many times to Scripture. You know, there's some all-inclusive Scriptures. God's not willing that any would perish. That is His will. Now, that may not be the way that it ends up. That, that's His will. That's why He wants us to pray for men everywhere. But to see, that is His will. God's not willing that any would perish, but all would have eternal life. The Bible says, whosoever believes upon the Lord will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's everybody that believes on him. But not every believer 
is going to be renewed in their strength. Not every believer is going to mount up or ascend or arise like the wings of eagles. Not every shall run and not weary. Not all shall walk and not faint. Who? Those who wait on the Lord. But I don't have time. Now, we've already dealt with the what you can do. And listen, where you start and where you'll finish should be two different places. But you've got to start. You've got to do something. There are steps to take. And so we've presented, I'm not saying that those are, those are the only things you could do, but those five things that get everybody started. They're five important things that everybody ought to be doing at some point in time in their lives. You could spend one more time on one than any of the others, or you can spend all your time on one. But that time you spend on the Lord is the most valuable time. You know, the Bible teaches us to redeem the time. That's the best redemption of the time that you'll ever make. Is a time that you spend with Him. See, when it says, those that wait on the Lord, that phrase, those that wait on the Lord, this is not about timing. And listen, and I believe that God does have a timing, but it's not about timing. This is not just about my, you know, that I've prayed, now I'm waiting for an answer. And, and, and listen, and that is true, but that's not what this verse is about. This verse is not about timing. It is about time with. See, you can go on about your business if it's all about timing. But it's not about timing. See, we'll mistake well, I prayed a prayer, and now I'm just going to go on because I'm, you know, it's it's just not God's time. And listen, I, again, I will say again, there is something to God's timing. I, I I believe that. I believe that. It just doesn't apply right here. This is not what we're talking about this morning. When we're talking about those that wait upon the Lord. Listen to this. I like this. All right, this is one of these you want to put in your bank. Your greatest moments with God will not come in a crowd. Your greatest moments with God will not come in a crowd. Moses went to the mountaintop, and there alone with God, he placed him in a cleft of the rock, and he passed by him. He saw his glory, his presence, his goodness. The only thing he didn't see was his face. While he's on, the, while he's on that mountain, the, the, the Lord carves out the Ten Commandments with him. You know, for the disciples, and you can think of all the tremendous moments. I mean, they were there when he fed the multitudes. They were there when he gave sight to the blind. Again, there's crowds there. But in their deepest and most difficult moment, they're locked alone in a room. And he walks through the wall. Or he appears. This moment, listen, he's already, think about these things. Think about it. All right? Shelly, he has already walked on water. But they're still hiding. He's already fed the multitude. He's already given uh, sight to the blind. The lame's already walked. The leper's already been cleansed. Amen. But that time in that room where the crowd's not present, but the Lord is, changes their lives forever. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew. See, you wait on the Lord many times in a time of trouble. But the truth is, it should be a practice in our lives. But they are in a time of trouble. So they what? They go and wait. Now, this is not about timing. This is about time with. Time with. Again, I'll, re I'll say again, I believe that God does have timing. You know, the time from the time you pray to the time the answer comes, we often know. That there's a gap. There's a gap. 
But this is just not what we're talking about this morning. See, we talk about your greatest moments in life won't come in a crowd. Revelations 1.10. John says this, the elder John. I was in the spirit wrapped in his power on the Lord's day. He'd been banished to the Isle of Patmos. He is such a problem. They need to do something with him. His greatest, John's greatest work, and you just think of the wonderful thing. The, the, the three epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, are beautiful. So much of it about the expressions of God's love. They're beautiful. They're wonderful. They're God-breathed. It is the word of God. But we have the, the revelation of God. Because he's on what? The Isle of Patmos. And on the Lord's day, he's in the spirit. And I heard behind me a great voice like the calling of a war trumpet. And he heard the voice of God. John's greatest moment was not in a crowd. It was alone with God. Wait means this. Again, see, well, now right now we're not talking about the time. We're talking about the, the with, the together. Wait, come together. Come together and place your hope in. Come together. When you read that in Isaiah, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Those who come together and place their hope in him. See, there's so many times, again, you, you just think about all the things that comes between us and our time with God. All the things that comes between us and reading the word, all the times that comes between us and our times of worship or service. Or, But boy, think about that time alone. And just about the time that you've decided you're going to have time alone, well, that's when the phone rings. And that's when the cow gets out. And that's when the kids left something at home. I'm telling you, it's the greatest time. It's the most important time. Wait. Come together. It's a time that you place your hope in. See, even when things are the greatest difficulty, and I will say it's of the greatest importance in difficult times that we have time alone with God. Why? We need a renewing. This is what the church needs today. They, they, need, they need what? They need a renewing. A renewing of their strength. So they what? They could once again can arise. Can arise. With all my disappointments over the last year, I still believe that God is able, he's willing, and he's moving. I believe that he's not done. I believe that there's trouble on the horizon, and I also believe that there's victories to be won. Wait. Come together. Place your hope in. See, waiting on the Lord does this. It transforms our view of God. For far too many people, once they get saved, they see God as a distant deity. When you wait upon the Lord, he becomes this. He becomes your closest friend. Your closest friend. You know, when you talk about God, it's such a vast subject, you know, because on one hand, we're talking about the creator of the universe. And then we can also talk about what? We can talk about a friend. Look at what it says in Exodus 33, 11, and it's, it, it's talking about Moses' relationship with God. And it says, And the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. I believe this is the way that God wants to speak to his people. As what? As a friend. Oh, listen, God can speak to you in his fury. He can speak as a just judge. 
but he wants to speak to you and I as a friend. Says this about Moses. Another place it says that that God does not speak to to Moses in in dark similitudes and likenesses. He's not speaking to him in in symbols, in images. Moses doesn't have to interpret what God's saying. I like this. He's speaking with him as a friend. Now that is accomplished when you spend time with. When you spend time with. We read Isaiah 64, 4 just once again. Again, since before time began, no one has ever imagined and no ear heard, no eye seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. Wow. I've never wasted my time. You've never wasted your time. You know, he could just ask us just to wait on him, and he is God. And he would be worthy of our time and our attention and our devotion. And not give us a thing, not recompense us in any way, but that is not who he is. He's a God who's what? He's working for those who wait for him. See, here's a verse that should revolutionize a life. Here's a verse that should revolutionize one's priorities. If you're a parent, I know how busy you are, and I know how demanding life is. If you're raising kids, you need what? (laughs) You need a God working for you. You're living in the midst of a pandemic. You need a God who's working for you. (laughs) You you live in a country whose government is chaotic. And I still think it's the greatest place upon the face of the earth. All right? They say a thousand people are marching up from Honduras because they're going to get a ticket. Not saying I approve, but you understand it's still the greatest place to live. It's one of the few places people are trying to break in to live. Most, most countries are trying to break out. Our country, they're trying to break in. Right? I mean, not very many people are trying to break into jail. It's a great place. In the midst of these difficult times, though, once again, we serve a God who what? Who works for those who wait on him. I need God working on my behalf. I need his help. I need him working for me. If I want him to work for me, what I need to do is wait on him. I want to reemphasize, though, that he's worthy of my waiting here regardless. He's, he's. But we think that there's all these things that we got to do, that we got to do. What we need is, again, to wait on him. Priceless is the time we spend in the Lord, with the Lord. For while we were waiting, the Lord was working. While we were waiting, the Lord was working. See, when the disciples when the, was in the garden, I, you know, that gosh, I, I got to get some sleep. And they went to sleep. Had they waited, he would have been working on their behalf. Again, we have this tremendous promise in Isaiah. And Isaiah again tells us that in 30, 40, 31, that they that wait upon the Lord, well, what? While they're waiting, they're being renewed. While they're, while they're waiting, they're arising, they're ascending. While they're waiting, they're, oh, they're being freed from their weariness. While they're waiting, they're being sustained. There'll be no fading, fainting. Again, we say the Lord works for those 
who are waiting on him. Again, I believe that I could just quit right now. And if you'd apply that to your life, we will accomplish more than a year's worth of preaching. I like to preach. It's not the word you know that changes your life. It's the word you practice that changes your life. Say amen. Say amen. Yeah. It's not what you know that changes your life. It's what you put to work in your life that changes. And so I'm doing the waiting, and he's doing the working. In this country, that many have done all they've known to do. Huh? Now what do you do? Now you probably do more of what we should have done before. And again, I, I, don't dis, I don't discount the importance to do the right thing. Do the right thing. Don't ever let it become a substitute for waiting on him. I'll remind you that the disciples, when they think it's their most difficult, darkest moment, I mean, they, they are taken so far back. They are, you know, you understand, in just days' time, they come from Jesus entering into, this, in, into Jerusalem with, with the palm tree branches being waved and the people shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Oh, they're celebrating him as a king, and they go from that to the crucifixion, to the tomb. And they've gone from here to here, not knowing that they're going to there. Because once again, we're talking about what? We're talking about the resurrection resurrection from their darkest moment they were only three days to what to the resurrection see the resurrection changes changed everything see while they were waiting the Lord was working wherever you're at in life right now and you wait before the Lord and you've, you've prayed you've, you've you believe God just continue to wait before him but because while you're waiting, something bigger than you is working. We serve a God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask or think. Again, before time began, who would have known that there'd be a God like you who would be working? Or we're just before him waiting. Isaiah 30, 15. This is what the almighty Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, you can be saved by returning to me. You can have rest. You can be strong by being... Oh, gosh. You can be strong by being what? And trusting me. Listen what he says, though. But you don't want to. We want to be busy. We want to fix it. You can be saved by what? Returning to me. You can have rest. You can be strong by being quiet, by trusting me. Again, you don't want ISIS, but they don't want to. Let's not that, let that be you and me. In Matthew 11, again, you see how these things I often say that, you know, that the, the word is just woven together in such a wonderful way. And, and here you find uh, uh, this truth woven in to waiting on the Lord. Come unto me, all of you that what? Labor, work, work, the work. We work outside the home. That's very real. We, we work at our relationship. Many times is sometimes it's hard. We're working at marriage. Sometimes we're working at our friendship. Sometimes we're working at making church work. There's a lot of things we work at. Come unto me, all the labor, all the that work, your heavy laden, your burden. And I will give you what? Take my yoke and what? Learn from me. Now listen to me. 
This is what happens in that time alone with God, waiting on God, having that quiet time. This is what it does. You what? You learn from him. For I'm gentle and lowly of heart. You will find what? Rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I've talked about this verse so many times. Again, we read it with Western eyes, but they didn't read it with Western eyes. They know exactly what he's talking about. They're talking about the yoke that was placed upon the ox. And the yoke is what they put on the ox to pull the plow, or whatever, the cart, to bear the burden, to do the work. And what he's saying to them is, listen, I'm the big ox. You're the little ox. They know exactly what he's saying. For the way they trained the young ox was that they would put him in a yoke with a mature ox, a strong ox, a big ox. And while the big ox was bearing the load, the little ox was learning from the big ox. While the little ox is, it's rest, it's easy, it's gentle, it's not hard or harsh. And see, we're still going to have to live in this world, but we still need that time to learn, to rest, and be refreshed, to be renewed. We're not without labor. We're not without work. But we come to him to get the burden off, the toll that it takes upon our lives. Exodus, the 14th chapter, verses 13 and 14, the Amplified Bible. Moses told the people, fear not. Stand still, firm, confident, undismayed. You know, Egyptians are coming down on them pretty hard. They're coming with chariots. They're coming with vengeance. For stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall work for you today. For the Egyptians you have seen today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you will hold your peace and remain at rest. While they are resting, the Lord is working. I like saying this, and I, I, I believe it. It's a, it's a deep conviction for me. You know, we are the object of God's affection and his attention. I know we're not deserving of it. But he places his on us. He, he said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I chose you. See, love sets a, a value upon someone. And the Father set a value upon us. And he values us so much that he's looking for some time. He's, and he's looking from, for affection and attention. He's looking for us to respond. To him and he, so he's saying this if you, if you just come and spend time with me because I'm telling you that you know he didn't have to place any benefit in it whatsoever he's God he could just require it he could just require it but what he wants is he he wants you to know him, and he wants to know you. We are the object of God's affection. This is why he says such extraordinary things. Why you talk about the promises of God being yes and amen, I'm, this, is, this is over the top. This is so much more larger than he'll meet my needs. And listen, there are times I need my needs met. I don't know about you. I do. I mean, I want him to be my present help in a time of trouble. But his promising that if I'll spend time with him, that he'd be working on my behalf. We're the object of God's affection, the object of his attention. He 
sent his son in the world. Why? Because we were the object of his affection and his attention. He was looking to redeem us back to him. He wants a relationship. But listen, to have a really good relationship, there has to be some fellowship. There has to be some time together. It's not just I believe in God. I've said so many times, unfortunately, far too many Christians practice crisis Christianity. And in a crisis, they pursue God. When the crisis is over, it's back to life as usual. And God in his goodness, well, he helps them in their crisis. Well, we end up learning so little and growing so little. We must get beyond as people of faith, get beyond living crisis Christianity. I am the object of God's affection and attention. So are you. He values it so much that he wants me to spend time with him, the creator of the universe, the most powerful, the most knowledgeable, and he wants me to tell him what's going on in my life. Not like he doesn't know, but he wants to share in it. He wants to, he wants the exchange. He wants my he wants your worship. He wants my worship. He wants your attention. He wants my attention. He wants your affection. He wants mine. There's an exchange that, that takes place. The word for love in the Old Testament is the word Hasid. Say Hasid. Hasid means this. It is the love of the greater, blessing the one who is the lesser. This is why Jesus says, greater love hath no man than this. Greater love. We are the object of his affection and his attention. Listen, we got to get beyond just trying not to make God mad. He's in love with you. He's in love with me. He wants to be personal. He wants there to be an intimacy. He wants us to know him. Psalms 33, verses 16 through 22. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is vain hope for deliverance. So buy some more guns. And I'm not anti-gun. But grateful for the Second Amendment. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. No horse. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him and on those who hope is in his unfailing love. You are the object of his affection. Victory is not in our strength. Victory is in his unfailing love. He goes on to say once again, whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death, to keep them alive from famine. What's good stuff? To wait in hope for the Lord. He's our help. He's our shield. In him our hearts rejoice. For we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord even as we put our hope in you. I return to Isaiah 64, verse 4. This is a contemporary English version, like the way this reads. You're the only God ever seen or heard of who works miracles for his followers. You know, there'd be a lot of religions that if you were going to go somewhere, you'd have to pick your gods up and take them with you. 
Think about that. If you were going to move from India to here, you'd have to pack them up, haul them with you. We don't have to haul our God around. He not only goes with us, he's already there. David said, there is no one like our beloved. Have you seen him? You're the only God who has ever seen or heard who works miracles for his followers. This is a God we know. This is a God we serve. I want to encourage you just how important and emphasize to you the time that you spent with God, how invaluable it is, how important it is. For while you're waiting on him, oh, he's not only working in you, he is working for you. Every head bowed, no one looking around. You may be here this morning and maybe you've never made a decision concerning the person of Christ. We'd like to give you an opportunity to do that. The Bible tells us that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. He cares so much even for those who perish. But he sent his what? He sent his best. Have you ever accepted God's son as your savior? See, we find that, that God has promised tremendous things to you and I. So many times, you know, you know that the world has what we want. We want to win an election, and listen, I want to win an election. I don't believe it was God's best. I, I believe that. I, I'll say it. I don't believe it was God's best. Are we, what we want was we want, to, we want to make more money. Listen, who don't need a little bit more money? What I want to do is I want to take a special vacation. Who doesn't need some time off? Listen, what we want and what we need is two different things. What we need is him. What we need is him. See, therein lies peace wherever you're at in life. There lies hope wherever you are in life. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, it's peace, it's joy. God could grant you what you could never get you could never have he said his son he's already done the heavy lifting he's died for our sin the burden on us is rather light I'm not saying there's without burden you have to do something you must invite him to be the Lord of your life this morning you not believe if you're here not an accident there we're in where we'd say that there's about timing. Oh, it's part of God's timing. The Bible says today's the day of salvation. If you've never accepted Christ, Christ, here's your opportunity. He's here. He's calling. Don't miss the moment. Let me ask you a few questions. Now, I want you to know that I'm not interested whether or not you've ever joined a church. And if you had, I'm glad for you. I'm not against it. I believe it's a good thing. I think scripture talks about being a member of his body. But that's good. We're not asking you if you've ever been baptized. And we believe in that. The scripture teaches we should follow Christ in baptism. Not concerned whether or not you ever attended Sunday school so much that you got a pin for it. Not asking you if grandma and grandpa believed in God or your mom and dad. Because God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has children. Have you ever accepted Christ as your Savior? Today's the day of salvation. See, bringing people to a point of decision is the very best you can do. So this is my best to bring you to a point. You just have to make a decision. 
Can you believe these things though? Can you believe that Jesus Christ came to earth and that he was God's own son? And most people would tell me, yes, Bill, I, I could believe that. I celebrate Christmas. That's a good. That doesn't mean you're saved, but it is good. Do you believe he lives a sinless life? And there would be those that say, I have no reason not to believe that. And, and again, how important that is. But again, that, that in and of itself doesn't save you. Do you believe that he died on the cross and that he died for your sin? Now we're personalizing it somewhat. And if you say, yes, I believe that, I would say that you're near to salvation. Can you believe this? Can you believe that God raised him from the dead? Now, if you believe those things, the Bible says you could be saved. John says this, for as many that believe upon him, to them he gives the power or the right, the ability to become the sons of God. So in just a moment, we're going to pray. If you believe those things, you only lack one thing, and that's to make him the Lord of your life. Now, everybody wants to be saved, and everybody wants to go to heaven. And God wants you to be saved. He wants you to go to heaven. The way to salvation is through the Lordship of Christ. When you accept him as Lord, when you give him control of your life, when you... When you not only give him your sin, but you give him your time, your gift, your talent. You're making him the Lord of your life. You're giving up control and giving it to him. You believe in what he did. He lived. He died. He died for you. He was raised from the dead. Now you say to that one, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I trust in you. I give you my heart. Change me cleanse me forgive me when you do that that's how salvation comes now maybe you've wandered in your faith so this would be a great opportunity for you to reaffirm your faith this morning if you've never asked the Lord into your life would you pray with us now I'm going to invite everyone to pray because the Bible says we can pray one for another you won't have to pray alone but you've got to believe it in your heart you're the one who has to believe by faith so let's pray together say this with me say dear heavenly father I believe in your son Jesus I believe that he lived I believe he lived a sinless life I believe he was judged for me I believe he died on the cross for me. He was punished for me. I believe God that he was buried for me. And I believe he was raised from the dead for me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me forgive me I accept you as my Lord take full control of my life you're my Lord and my Savior I accept you now thank you for forgiving me and for changing me Jesus God I'm your child and I thank you for saving me now. In Jesus' name, amen. With every head bowed, no one looking around, you might be here this morning and say, Pastor Bill, I'm not certain that I've ever asked Christ to come into my life. If you're listening online, we pose the same question to you. You may be listening, but maybe you've never asked Christ to come into your life before. Second of all, you might be, you might be here or listening online and Maybe you've known the Lord, but you've recommitted. You reaffirmed your faith. If you're listening online. Thank you for doing that. Please tell somebody. Contact us.
If you're in this room, this is what we're going to ask you to do. Not going to embarrass you. Not going to do anything, make you feel awkward. No one else is looking. Every head's bowed. I want to know who we prayed with and for. If you're here this morning, say, Bill, I'm not certain I've ever asked Christ into my heart before, but I did this morning. I meant it. Or two, I've known the Lord, but I've wandered in my way. And this this morning, I've re, I've recommitted. I've reaffirmed my faith. If that's you on either one of those invitations, just look up. No one else is looking around. Give us just a brief moment. Give us a moment looking around the room. So, Pastor Bill, that's me. Just wait for our eyes to meet. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you. Thank you, Father. Amen. Thank you. Father, I thank you. You look down from heaven. You see more than our eyes. You see our hearts. You see the decisions and the commitments that we make. I believe your love is shed abroad in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. I thank you for so great a salvation. And Father, and because it's so great, we've not neglected it this morning. We've given attention to it. God, you're our everything. Thank you for an opportunity for just these few moments, Lord, to wait on you, to wait on your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Father, for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, I like to tell people, Jesus said, you know, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. But if you're not ashamed of me, I will not be ashamed of you. I will, I will, I will plead your case. I'll confess you before my father. Tell somebody, if you've made a decision, tell somebody, listen, I made a decision for Christ this morning. I said, I, 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 I prayed. I didn't just pray. I meant it. Jesus is my Lord. Tell somebody that's important in your life. If you need someone to tell in a little bit, there'll be some prayer partners up here, and they'll be glad to pray with you. I'm going to turn the service to Leon. Give Leon a hand as he comes.